Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, come on, where else do you get to sing and dance first thing in the morning, uh, except with Cadre? Um, welcome. My name is Cindy Stewart. I am uh, your instructor for today. Um, a retired emergency manager. I currently live in Vancouver, Washington. I retired a couple of years ago from uh, Santa Clara County as an emergency manager, uh, where I actually uh, put 56 county departments through the COOP planning process, very similar to what I'm going to talk to you about today. So, um, <clears throat> We've been doing this for a little while. Most of the local uh, government agencies have continuity of operations plans, and um, we've worked with some of them as uh, contractors it's since I've retired as well. So uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, today, we have with us um, our co-instructor, co Lynn Brown. Uh, Lynn is also retired from the uh, Emergency Management Arena, and Marsha Havi, who is our Executive Director. Marsha will be um, our Access Coordinator as well. Um, I would ask if you are, um, are speaking, if uh, you've been asked to speak, if you would uh, please unmute yourself and um, put your, your uh, video on as well because we do have uh, people online that would like to be able to read your lips if you're speaking. So if you could do that, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, this is going to be an interactive session, so I'm hoping that you will participate in uh, some of the interactions that uh, take place as we go through the process a little bit this morning. Um, if we don't have any questions and we're ready to go, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. And that would be my cue, just to remind everyone to download the MyShake app. The MyShake app gives you advanced warning that an earthquake is going to happen. It works in Washington and California and, and Oregon. It gives you a few seconds to up to a minute. When San Jose had an earthquake a few months ago, we were the epicenter, so we got only a couple seconds of warning, but San Francisco got 18 seconds, which allows you time, <clears throat> sorry, time to get off a ladder, get away from a glass window or protect yourself. So just look in your app store for my shake and you'll be able to download that. And then also on our website, we have earthquake safety information, just basic preparedness for your home and what to do in the case of an emergency after an earthquake at home, translated now into 17 languages. We have audios for some of the languages, not all. We do have an ASL version, and hopefully we'll, we will continue to build on that as, we're, as uh, we get more interpreters. Right. So talking about earthquakes, I, you know, when I originally was going to do this presentation, it was supposed to be done in January. And so this um, particular slide might have been a little more uh, meaningful back then, but, you know, earthquakes are earthquakes are earthquakes, you know. And in Humboldt County, if, as you might recall, in December, they had a rather large earthquake, 6.4 um, a half a mile offshore, and it happened at 2.40 in the morning. Um, there were a couple of deaths. There were 3 million people notified using the MyShake app, and um, uh, the, some of the closest ones actually even got 10 seconds of notice. So, you know, I, I'm not sure how, how good, what, what you could accomplish with 10 seconds, but we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, anyway, there was a lot of destruction and damage, and um, that earthquake was uh, was pretty scary, and there's a lot of fallout from it still happening in the recovery arena as we speak. It will take a long time to do some of the cleanup and, and um, make sure that everyone is back to some semblance of normal after that earthquake. 
but what would happen if it were to happen here? And I just wanted to kind of divert our energy a little bit this morning to talk a little bit about what would happen if an earthquake that size happened here. So Marsha, if you'll go on to the next slide. It's 2.40 in the morning, and I don't know, um, where are you at 2.40 in the morning? Probably you're at home. I'm in bed asleep. Um, maybe the MyShake app went off. It would for me because I've downloaded it. If you've downloaded the MyShake app, the MyShake app may have gone off. You have 10 seconds, 10 seconds. So what can you get accomplished in 10 seconds? If you're asleep in your bed and you get a notification that in 10 seconds, there's going to be an earthquake. Just write some things into chat and let us know what you think you could accomplish in that 10 seconds. I'm gonna give you uh, 10 seconds on my phone so that you can talk or think about that. <clears throat> Find my wallet and my glasses. Mm -hmm. Drop under the bed. Crawl under my desk. Stay in my bed. Mm -hmm. Put on my shoes. Sure. Sure. If you've got something hanging above your bed, many of us have ceiling fans, uh, light fixtures, those kind of things hanging above the bed. Under those circumstances, it may be better to drop beside the bed to get out from under that glass that may be falling. If you're in your bed and you don't have anything above your bed, like, I, like me, I'm going to stay in my bed. I'm going to cover myself up with the, with my covers and I'm going to stay in my bed. That's probably the very safest place for me to be. But with that 10 seconds, you may be able to do some things that you couldn't do without that 10 seconds, you know, without that little bit of warning. So the My Shake app is, is pretty important. And thank you for participating and for um, for waking up this morning and uh and actually being a part of our uh, of our little discussion about earthquakes. Now we'll move on and talk a little bit more about the real reason that we're here, which is continuity of operations planning. This is a two session uh, presentation, two two hour sessions. Maybe I'll get you out a little bit early. We'll see how that goes. But we're going to define continuity of operations. We're going to talk a little bit about what it is and how we as CBOs can use it to uh, help our agencies in a disaster. In the second session, we'll dive a little deeper into some of the COOP procedures. But for the first session, we're just going to dip our toes in the water of what is a continuity of operations plan and what are essential functions. That's where we're gonna start. So Marcia, if you'd like to go on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So let's talk about what continuity of operations is. First of all, when people say COOP, they think that means the, the acronym is continuity of operations plan. They think the P means plan, it does not. COOP is continuity of operations of OPS, OP. So when you say COOP plan, you are correct. Um, unlike some of the other acronyms that we use in this world, um, this one is actually, the P actually is part of operations. A continuity of operations planning is an effort within an organization to ensure that essential functions, and we're going to talk a lot about essential functions today, continue to get performed in a wide range of emergencies. And that's the official uh, definition of the continuity of operations plan. Go ahead. So what time frame are we talking about? We're looking at those essential functions, those things that we absolutely have to keep going as an agency, the, the, uh, the activities that you're mandated to do. We need to get those back up and running within the first 12 hours after bang. A continuity of operations plan does not have a specific 
disaster in mind. It's for any disaster. It's for a small disaster or a large disaster. It's, it could be, um, uh, it doesn't, it, it isn't specific to a disaster. It's, it is specific to a time frame. however. It's kind of the gap plan that we've written in advance that can give us a little bit of time right after the disaster happens up to say 30 days, you know, maybe a little more or the end of the disaster, whichever comes first. So it's kind of our, it's the, it's the turn to plan when whatever happens, happens. And some people need to respond to the disaster and some people need to just keep essential functions running. So that's, it's kind of our stopgap plan, if you will. It can be activated in case of, uh, in, in, it, in advance of an emergency operations plan. It doesn't have to have the emergency operations plan activated in order to activate the coup plan. Um, it can be activated simultaneously with a coup plan, depending on the disaster. It really is a separate document and its focus is on those essential functions. Next slide. So when do you activate the COOP plan? Whenever it's impossible for employees to work their regular jobs in the regular facility. So primarily, if your building is not, is not available, it could be because there's been a single fire in your building and maybe your agency's got multiple buildings. You could move everyone from that one building to another building. It's, it could be a situation where you just don't have power for that day or you just don't have uh, communications for that one day. I remember uh, we had a situation where a construction crew had, um, had cut a main uh, line for uh, uh, 70 West and the whole building where the county exec's office is at 70 West heading, um, the whole building was without power and without phones. And they, that happened for three days. It wasn't really a disaster per se. It certainly was for the people working in that building. And they had to activate their coop plans and go to their alternate facilities. Uh, the county exec's office actually came across the street to the emergency operations center and um, county council and such all came and worked out of the EOC at that time for three days until they could get the, uh, the lines up and running and get the building back in <clears throat> position. Activating a coop under those circumstances is a perfect example of, of when to activate a coop. Of course, a coop could be activated during a regional large event. You, you may, many people may have their coops activated as we speak or have had their coops activated in the last you know, few weeks with all of the flooding and the storms that have been happening around the county. Um, any of you actually have a continuity of operations plan? Um, raise your hand and, and let's see if, uh, if any of those COOP plans have been activated recently. Anybody? Okay, well, that's probably why you're here because maybe you don't have a COOP plan yet. Next year when the same disasters happen because the, those floods and those those uh, kinds of events are not going to go away, as we know. Um, maybe you'll have a coup plan, and you'll be able to uh, to activate your coup plan and move through those pro that process a little faster yourselves. Cindy, some people. It was probably just a minute. Took a minute to get to their raised hand, oh. but we did get three. Oh, uh, Lars, Eric, and Bernadette, and Sherry. Lars, would you um, would you like to share about have you activated your coup plan recently? Can you see and hear me? Fast check. Yes, sir. Great, just checking on that. Um, we're currently living it. Are you? Long story short, just just a long story short. I mean, we are still working remotely. It's actually working out better. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, it, it's become kind of our normal mode of operation. So you know, things that happen now is if some of our staff have issues with internet connections working remotely, then they come into the to our office location. 
And we're probably gonna start doing cycles and things like my daughter does for her law office. But um, yeah, we're kind of living it now. It's become our normal mode of operating really. Yeah, I hear you. Bernadette, can you, do you wanna share something with us about your COOP plan? Um, you know, it's interesting because we implemented it uh, during the hard rains, mm -hmm. uh, strong rains, and um, we figured out what else is missing from our COOP plan. Oh, good. Yeah, that's a, a perfect time to uh, yes. <laughs> to test it and see whether it's working or not. Absolutely. So we have a lot of work to do. So um, that's why we're here to see what else we can put in into our cook. That's great. How about you, Sherry? Yeah, good morning. Um, like Lars, we uh, definitely implemented our plan uh, when the pandemic hit uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, like many agencies, we had to pivot to working from home. And because we had most of the things in place that we needed to and a, a plan to move forward, we were able to be you know, up and running within, uh, well, partially within 12 hours and fully within 24 hours. Um, and so, and it's still in place. And like Bernadette, it also gave us an opportunity to evaluate where we were missing a few pieces and had to, had to uh, update and, and uh, you know, uh, create new new planning um, pieces for, for for areas that we hadn't thought about. So it was definitely helpful. Uh, during the uh, atmospheric river events, um, my agency is responsible for providing um, assistance to medical baseline customers uh, who have been without power for many, many days, sometimes weeks. And so we uh, partially within one department um, have been activated uh, as far as our, our plan as well um, for the last couple of months. That's great. David says that they do have a coup plan and that they've activated it during the rains and the floods. Um, that's that's great. And Cora says sh that she thinks that they have a coup plan, uh, though she's not really aware of the details. One of the things that I found interesting with the county was we, um, when I was working at the county and we were involved in the coop planning, what we did for departments at that time, like I said, there were 56 departments that went through coop planning and we gave all of the departments little stickers that they could put on people's badges. They had four different colors. Uh, red was that they were an, a first responder and that they were going to have to respond directly to whatever the disaster was. Um, blue was that they were an administrative person and that they would be available uh, to do things like help run a phone bank or those kind of things. Um, green meant that they were coming to the emergency operations center and that they were a part of that planning process. And yellow meant that they were a part of COOP and the yellow sticker had the word COOP on it. You know, And after we did the COOP planning, um, we suggested that all of the departments train their staff to be able to, um, to activate their COOP and to, to move into those, uh, doing those essential functions and doing that, uh, those things that are needed by COOP. And uh, I taught many different classes in the Emergency Operations Center while I was there. And every time I'd have a class that had students in it that were uh, from departments in the county, which was often, I would ask them, raise your hand if you've got a yellow sticker on your badge that says you are a part of the COOP plan. And they'd all raise their hands very proudly, you know. And then I'd say, keep your hand in the air if you know that that means that you are written into that COOP plan and you know what you're going to do. And many of them would lower their hands. They didn't know that the, that there had that, that they had been written into the COOP plan and that the reason that they had that yellow sticker on their badge was because was to denote that they were going to do some kind of task that was required by the COOP plan. So, you know, we'd send them back to talk to their department heads to figure out, give me a copy of this COOP plan so that I can read about what it is that I'm supposed to be doing during an activation of the COOP. So one of the things that's critically important in the COOP planning process is to make sure that those people that you have assigned to do those, those essential functions in an activation know that that's what they're supposed to do and that they're, that they're trained to do what it is that, you, that you're expecting them to accomplish. 
Um, Mariana, my name is Cindy Stewart. You're asking what's the name of the person who's teaching. Uh, my name is Cindy Stewart. <clears throat> uh, Mateo says that they've also got a, an emergency plan. Great. Okay, Marcia, let's move on to the next slide. So COOP is written with 10 elements. And those elements, go ahead and click. Those elements focus around essential functions. Those functions that you've, you've been mandated to do, those functions that we'll talk a little bit more about some of the criteria for what makes a function an essential function. But what I will say to you is that your agency needs to determine what those essential functions are, and your agency needs to determine what those essential, what are not essential functions for your department, for your, for your agency. So it's very personal to your agency. Some, depart, some agencies may have um, essential functions that other agencies don't have, like HR may have um, personnel uh, uh, hiring process as one of their essential functions and other departments may not have that. So it's very personal to your agency, but this entire plan is written about around what are those essential functions and then how are we gonna get them done? So the first thing, go ahead and click Marcia. The first thing is who's going to do those essential functions? Go ahead and click. So that is delegation of authority, orders of succession, and human capital management. That's all around the who is going to do those essential functions. The next leg is resources. What are we gonna to need to keep these essential functions up and, float, up and running? Do we need a facility? Go ahead. Do we need communications? Go ahead. How are we going to access our vital records? How will that happen? And then there are kind of what I call wraparound procedures. Those procedures might be devolution. What happens if our agency can't do it at all? How will those essential functions, they're essential. So someone's depending on them. Who's going to do them if no one in our agency can do them? We need to write that into our plan and make sure that we understand that as well. Go ahead. And then reconstitution, how do we reverse engineer this whole process and get back from an activated coop in an alternate facility using continuity communications and maybe hard copy records to our normal or whatever the new normal is. And then of course, the last one being, let's test this thing. Let's train everyone to make sure that we all know what we're supposed to be doing and let's exercise it. And I am a huge advocate of Exercise often, use your plans, make sure that people are familiar with the plans that you have. They're not gonna do anyone any good if they're holding up the couch in the, in the break room. You know, they're, they're, they need to be out, be dusted off often and used and, and, and practiced. Go ahead. So let's understand what an essential function is. An essential function in essence is that thing, those tasks, those activities that cannot be deferred even during a disaster. Those activities that must be performed, that must be continued, that have to be resumed quickly, doesn't matter what the disaster is. So they could be something like payroll. Does payroll have to happen? Now, remember, we're talking a short duration. Does payroll have to happen? If payroll has to happen, how can we do payroll without files, without our records? Maybe we take the payroll that, they, that we paid them last pay period and just give that to them again and then adjust later when the disaster is over. <coughs> we write those things into our plan. More importantly, I think what is what is not necessarily an essential function. Because I, I see often 
where departments or agencies get kind of wrapped around, oh, it's important. So it's important to our agency. So it must be an essential function and not necessarily, you know, it might be the budget item that has taken up the biggest amount of the budget this year, but it's not necessarily an essential function. It's not, those two are not connected to each other. It might be the reason that the manager has the headcount that they do. But again, you know, it's, they're not tied together. The headcount isn't going to go away if you don't write that this, that this task is an essential function. It shouldn't go away. It might be the executive director's pet project. No, just because the executive director has this project that they're focused on does not necessarily mean that it's an essential function. Okay. So go ahead, Marcia. So let's see what it is. What makes it essential? Why is it essential? Well, in local government, we talk about it protects life, property, or the environment. That's, those are all pretty safe bets. If it's a, a function that's, that's protecting life, property, or the environment, if it's providing a service like power or food or those kind of essential things that people need every day, then it's probably an essential function. If it's mandated, if you've got a state mandate or a federal mandate that says you have to have this function up and running and going, the service provided to your um, client base, um, no matter what, then, then that mandate has made it an essential function for you. Some of the ones that are a little bit less conspicuous, I think, are... Um, the receiver of the service, if it's critical to the person that's receiving that service, it should probably be written in as an essential function. If that, if it's, if, if you're serving uh, a client base that is dependent on the service that you're providing, then it's probably an essential function. If it supports the critical or essential functions of someone else, if you're the vendor that gets the food to the distributor, then it's essential. <clears throat> it's essential, uh, then it, that makes it an essential function. Um, someone's asking, Jan is asking, yes, Jan, this PowerPoint will be shared. We will have it on our website. The video will also, this video will also be on our website as will any other handout materials that we provide to you. Uh, today as and next next Monday, which is the second half of this session, okay? And then all of those things are based on a risk factor, you know, on considering an, an, a risk analysis um, and, you know, what happens if we don't provide this function. And under, under the planning process, we go through each and every function and look at what what happens if we don't do this thing? What happens if we don't pick up the mail? Is there going to be some kind of fallout if no one comes to pick up the mail? I know with this pandemic that we've been all living through for the last few years, I've written a couple of continuity of operations plans for some of the cities in Santa Clara County. And one of them was written for... Um, uh, department one of them was written for a city and the um, the city clerk was um, part of that process and she said I want picking up the mail to be an essential function because um, during the pandemic we couldn't get down to the office to pick up the mail and big things happened that were a huge fallout from just not something as simple as not being able to pick up the mail so those kind of things need to be taken into consideration. And then, of course, our secondary criteria. It isn't that this is essential forever, that we have to do it like this forever. Is, is it essential in the next 30 days? So again, going back to the, to the example of payroll, is payroll, is it essential that payroll be considered, that it, that it be um, put 
out exactly the way it is on a daily basis? Or is there a way to do some stopgap payments to employees for, for, for the next 30 days and then to adjust those records in the future? So maybe, you know, if you're, if you're, um, staff only get paid every two weeks, maybe you can take last the last two weeks payments and and use that and it won't necessarily be essential. Uh, Cora says a lot of essential functions are different for different programs that we have. So we should have several different COOP plans according to the type of program it is. Um, we, we've done it both ways. Um, I've done a city, I've written a coup plan for the city and all the different departments participated in the planning process and wrote one coup plan for the full city. And then for another city, they decided that they wanted it written by department. So they took the departments that were that they had that had essential functions and each department had their own separate coup plan. Now, I would say to you that it kind of depends on the size of your agency. It kind of depends on the difference of your essential functions. But even if you were to write one coup plan for your entire agency, you could break out those essential functions for each department. And you could have um, multiple different uh, uh, alternate facilities, say, for example, your HR department has goes to the community center or to uh, some other place, um, you know, your your departments could be broken out and each department could could within your agency have a little bit of difference written into the plan. You can do it either way. In some cases, when the agency is very small and I and I tend to not recommend this, but some, in some cases, the elements of a continuity of operations plan are written into the emergency operations plan. Now, it causes confusion, in my opinion, to have that happen, because what usually comes down from that is that it gets muddy. And what is Remember, continuity of operations plan is very different from an emergency operations plan. Emergency operations plan, we have a whole team of people that are focused on just responding to the disaster. Continuity of operations plan doesn't even care what the disaster is. Continuity of operations plan focused only on those essential functions and keeping that stuff afloat. So two very different perspectives and two very different um, uh, very different um, uh, goals in in continuity of operations plan versus emergency operations plan. Okay. Next slide. Okay, so right in the chat, just if you can come up with you know three, four, maybe five things that you think your department would consider essential essential functions for your department, just off the top of your head. You know, I don't know what your agency does, but if they've got essential functions, maybe, um, you know, we talked to the libraries at one point and realized that, yes, they do have a response in, um, in a disaster. They're very important. They have to stand up uh, comfort centers and different things, and they have to be a part of that response side. But do we have to put the library books back on the shelf? Is that essential? No. So they found that they actually didn't even really need a continuity of operations plan because they didn't have any essential functions. So some of you are saying things like food distribution and providing prescriptions and social security, food pantry, housing, the, all of those kind of things. Those are going to be essential functions, most definitely. Counseling services, drug treatment, those are going to be essential functions. Yeah. Mental health services. See, so you, you all need continuity of operations plans. Absolutely. Yeah. Referral and case management, housing, payroll. Mm -hmm. Good, good. As we, uh, as we, 
continue, let's, you know, if you come up with things, if you think of things, or if you, you know, just raise your hand and uh, I'll, I'll have um, um, <clears throat> Lynn watch for you to see if, uh, uh, if, if we need to stop for a second and have discussion around some of those essential functions, temporary shelter locations, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. Securing vital records. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is Marsha. I have a question. The temporary shelter locations are those disaster related shelters? Then that would be part of your emergency plan. That would be that would be focused on responding to the disaster. Yeah. And it's very confusing. So yeah. I, I had to think about it for a minute before I said that because it's like, okay. Would it would it need to happen if there wasn't a disaster? And if that's not the case, then it does go in the emergency plan. Well, and do you provide temporary shelter locations every day? Is that part of your mission? Is that and, part? Of your yeah. And so if that's if that's the case, if you're offering a shelter to unhoused people every day, then that would be an essential function. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. So we're gonna talk about a process a little bit and you can see the slide is empty right now, but it will be full by the time we get finished here. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about what the, the COOP process looks like. So go ahead and, and click. So first of all, bang happens. What's bang? We don't care. We don't care what bang is. Whatever bang is, it happens, okay? <clears throat> uh, whether it's an earthquake or a flood or a fire or whatever, we bang has happened. <clears throat> Very first thing we do is we continue only after we have responded to the disaster in whatever emergency response procedures we have. Those should be separate procedures. We evacuate the building, we duck cover hold, we um, shelter in place, whatever those emergency procedures are, based on what the disaster is, do those first. That's the first thing that needs to happen, okay? Then after that, we've done those things, then we take a look at in our COOP plan under our delegation of authority and under our orders of succession, we look around and we go, who's here? Who's available to put together a COOP activation team? That COOP activation team is going to be very critical to activating the COOP and to determining whether or not to activate the COOP, as well as answering all of those kind of questions about the COOP, okay? So we pull together who's here, who's got the authority to do different things, who's gonna be focused on responding to the disaster and who can be a part of the COOP activation team. We've assembled that team now. There's three or four of us. Um, if we are a very small agency, it might be, the, might be one person is in charge of being the COOP activation team. And that person then goes forward to make those, those decisions. We go ahead to the next, we assess the situation and we decide whether or not we need to activate the coop. Does a coop need to be activated because the building caught on fire? We, we know we need to respond to the fact that the building caught on fire, but we don't know whether or not we need to activate the coop if it's a situation where the building caught on fire and our part of the building isn't really damaged but everybody goes home for the day and comes back tomorrow and everything is normal, then we go ahead and resume normal operations. Maybe we don't use that part of the building, you know, but <laughs> if it's a situation where the, you know, where we're going to be out for out of that building for several days and we still need to keep those essential functions going, then yes, we should activate our coop. And I would encourage you to activate your coop often because that's the best way to learn how to use your coop plan is to activate it often. And if you activated it and you didn't need it, that's not a big deal. 
you'll be able to um, deactivate it quickly and, and, and go back to normal operations. No big deal. But if you do decide that you have to activate your coop, go ahead, Marcia. Then we're gonna go on to the next slide. If the answer is yes, we are gonna activate the coop. Click again. Then we've got some decisions we need to make. Okay, we've decided that we're gonna activate our coop. Now we stop doing all of those functions, all of those activities, all of those things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis and we focus only on what are the essential functions what needs to be done. Hopefully, we, we know, the people that do those essential functions day to day know that they're a part of the COOP plan and they know how to continue those essential functions. They focus on only those essential functions. The COOP activation team then takes a look at who do we have left over? Who, who can we, uh, who, who's cross-trained to maybe help with those essential functions? Um, and, and what are the next questions going forward? Go ahead and, and click again. Take a look at our staffing. Do we have adequate staffing to keep all those essential functions up and running? If the answer is yes, then we move on to the next question. If the answer is no, go ahead and click. Then we call for additional staff. Some of those people that don't do essential functions that aren't responsible for essential functions need to be cross-trained to assist with essential functions when the if and when the time comes. You know, uh, COVID was a, a great example for us of what do we do if we've only got 25% of our staff or 15% of our staff available because no one else can come to work or no one else has got a laptop and can work from home. This is why it's so critical that each essential function be looked at in depth and we figure out, okay, we've got these three people that are gonna do this function. What happens if none of them are available? Is anyone else cross-trained? Does anyone else have the passwords to get into that system? Can anyone else write those checks? How do we get those things accomplished if we don't have the adequate staff and we can call for additional staff? If we don't have enough staff, if we go, oh, there's not enough of us to even be able to get this function done, can we call on a sister agency to assist us? Can we call on someone else to, do we have a volunteer base that might be able to come in and help with those essential functions? Can we break those essential functions down into small enough pieces and maybe write procedures so that we could give procedures to someone who has never done that function before and they could pick up that function and do it going forward. That's where that cross-training is gonna be so important. If the answer is yes, we do have it adequate staff, then go ahead. We move on to the next question. The next question being, is our facility okay? Do we have the ability to use this building? Has it been an earthquake and we don't know whether or not the building inspector is gonna let us back in? Is it, a, a, is it a pandemic where people are not coming into the building or not allowed into the building? Is it a flood where the building is fine but we don't have access to get into the building because the roads are all flooded? Those are all situations where we might need to move to an alternate location. Now, because of the pandemic, we, are, we have a little bit of an advantage in that situation because many of us had to work from home for a very long time or had to work in an alternate location or under alternate circumstances. And so we, you know, our, our IT departments have, you know, passed out lots of laptops and lots of VPNs and we've got um, internet connectivity that we've never had before, you know, that have that allow us to be able to spread out around the county and do our functions from lots of different locations. And maybe it's not a situation where we're going to move into just one alternate location. Maybe it's a situation where we're gonna go into a virtual environment. Um, if that's the situation though, the next question is going to be critical because 
it's very difficult to communicate in a disaster. I don't care what the situation is, but it's exceptionally difficult if you're scattered all around the city and you're, you know, everyone is working from home, making sure that we have those Zoom calls or those, you know, those, the ability to communicate in from alternate locations, from multiple alternate locations becomes a little more difficult. If we need to, we've written into our coup plan, what is that location that, if, that we're going, if we're going to an alternate location, what's the address of that location? How do we get into that building? What if it's the middle of the night? Who's got keys to that building? Who's given us the, um, the okay to use that building? All of those kind of things. Do we have the supplies that we need? Cindy, your audio went out. Audio went out? Hello? Yeah, last couple of sentences. Oh, no. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Interesting. Okay. So, um, Last sentence I heard was the keys to the building. Okay, so um, who's got the keys to the building? Who's got permission to um, to get into that building? What if it's the middle of the night? Do we have supplies that we need to, to do our essential functions in that building? Have we put a little box together? Did we bring something with us? All of those kind of questions, you know, when it comes to that alternate facility should be written into our coop plan. How do we get into that building? How do we, you know, how do we tell people that that's where we're going? If our building is fine, we go on to the next question. Go ahead, Marcia. So what about our communications? You know, maybe we're in an alternate building. Maybe we're in a virtual environment and we need to communicate with each other. What are our communication devices? We're not talking about what the message is. What are we saying to each other? Because that's going to be specific to the department, to the agency, to the tasks, the essential functions that you need to accomplish. So it's not about the message. It's about what devices are we using? Are we using cell phones? Have we decided that we're going to text only? Can we still use email? Is the, is the internet up and running? Are we are do we have our VPN available? Do we have a Zoom? Can we get into it? Is it blocked? Can are are we going to um, maybe meet someplace or try and put together a face to face uh, communications? Do we under the most extreme circumstances do we have messengers that we could send back and forth? Uh, do we have ham radio operators that work for our agency that might be able to communicate using a radio? All of those kind of communications uh, questions and that alternate communication uh, circumstance needs to be written into our into our coop plan. So if the answer is no, then go ahead, Marcia. If the answer is no, then we start looking at our continuity of communications. Who's got a ham radio? Uh, who's got who's got a, a, an ability to communicate in some other way? If the answer is yes, then we move on to the next question. And the next question is, how do we access those vital records or those systems that we need to access in order to get those essential functions done? What about our vendors? Do our vendors, are our vendors sustainable? Have our vendors been able to Will they be able to give us the things that we need to be able to keep our essential functions going? Um, what if they can't? Do we have backups for them? All this gets written into our continuity of operations plan. So you can see how critically important this plan becomes when we, if we don't know all this stuff, we could be dropping essential functions and not providing those, those services that are critical to, to others or to our own agency in the middle of a disaster. 
That's why we write a coop plan so that we can keep those essential functions going so that we know what the backup plan is for doing payroll if we don't have access to those vital records. If the answer is no here, go ahead, Marcia. Then we turn to that page for those backup systems and those backup procedures that's already written into our continuity of operations plan. Okay, so that's kind of the crux of the of the coup. Now we've got all, we've answered all those questions. If the answer was no, we came up with an alternate location. We came up with our alternate communications. We are using our backup systems. And we then, go ahead, Marcia. Keep this thing running. We get it back up and running within 12 hours and we keep it running for 30 days or until somebody else, whoever's not part of this procedure, our management team is in the interim working on a longer term plan, trying to figure out how we're going to move forward at this point. You know, once they've got the the pressure is off of them to keep those essential functions up and running. Now it's their job to figure out how do we respond to this disaster and what do we do going forward? What's the longer term plan? Okay. If there is no longer term plan, then maybe they make the decision that these essential functions are going to be passed off to another agency, to the city, to the state, to your partner in another uh, in another department or whatever the circumstances are and, you know, the consideration for the de devolution of the plan of the essential functions and you hand those off to someone else to do them. Okay. Go ahead, Marcia. All right. We've done this now for 30 days. Management has come up with our longer term plans. Maybe management comes up with a plan that says, you know, it's going to take us 45 days to get the building back up and running. So can we keep those essential functions going through the coup plan? Can we continue the activation of the coup plan for another two weeks? Yes, you can. You know, it's not a hard set 30 days. It's not a hard set end of the disaster. You can keep your coup plan going for as long as you need to. If you've written it properly, you can keep it running for as long as you need to keep it running. Um, but once it's time to reconstitute and to go back and get back to some semblance of normal, there's a procedure in that. You know, we're in an alternate location. We don't want to drop any of those hard copy files. We want to make sure that we get those back into our systems properly, right? <laughs> we want everyone to know that our communications are back up and running and we are communicating the same way we have in the past on our day-to-day -day communications. So we have to re-engineer. Excuse me. We have to reverse engineer that whole process of activating the coop in order to deactivate the coop and get us back to normal. So what does that look like? Go ahead, Marcia. We're gonna bring those vital records back up. We're gonna make sure that those systems are back in place. We're gonna make sure that those vendors are back online or whatever the alternative is, whatever the alternative is to any of those things, okay? Maybe we have to use the backup, um, uh, system that we have established for all of our electronic files. Maybe we have to use, maybe that has to become our primary and we need to going forward, think of something else to do for a backup system. Whatever the new normal looks like, we bring those vital records and those things back together, those vendors back online. Go ahead. And you can kind of see where this is going, right? We go back to our primary, a facility and we re restore our primary communications. We resume our normal staffing. We bring those people back and we start doing all of the functions, not just the essential functions that we've done, uh, that we've been doing for the last 30 days or however long it's been. We start doing all of the, uh, all of the functions. Now this might happen in stages. We might come back and be able to bring back on only 50% of our staff. And maybe we can get essential functions done and a little bit more. 
So that's kind of a place where when we're establishing our essential functions, we might make them in tiers. We might have a tier one essential functions, those things that absolutely have to keep running. And then if we've got staff and, and the ability, a tier two of essential functions, those things that as we bring things back up and running, they become a, a part of that process as well. And so maybe we can get those tier two essential functions back up and running as well. You know, it and we can get back to some semblance of normal or a modified normal, whatever that looks like, depending on the disaster. Okay, so that's the process. That's the way we go through using the COOP plan. And that's why we write each of the segments of the COOP plan. Questions at this point? Did I just completely overwhelm you? I hope not. But if I did, it's okay. We're going to go over some of this stuff again next week. Right now, we really just want to focus on what are those essential functions and that very beginning piece that we talked about. Lars says, overwhelmed, no, but it's a lot. Absolutely. Do we have a template or an example of a coup plan? There are lots of examples of coup plans out there. If you just Google coup plans, um, there are plenty of examples. I do have a template coup plan. We're going to talk about um, distributing that. I am going to give you today a set of uh, worksheets that you can use to create a coup plan from. That's going to be one of the things that you'll get at the end of this session today. Okay. All right. On our current plan, we actually have communications first because it's necessary for us to be able to accomplish any other steps. Good point, Lars. Um, these things may not necessarily, these, those little yellow triangles may not necessarily be in the order that you'll do them. You may, you may need to put communications first or to put a facility before staffing. That, that is not necessarily um, step by step. Those, those good point, those four triangles could be um, altered somehow but they always will be an if it's no, then move on to the next, if it's no, do the alternative that's written in the coop plan. Cora says we have staff all over three different cities in multiple buildings. How do we do this for that many different sites? So you write your essential functions for each of your sites and your sites become uh, separate uh, addenda, uh, um, sorry, appendices to your coup plan. Your coup plan is written as a whole plan and each site has its staffing, its alternate locations, your maybe your communications is overall communications. I don't know if your backup systems are a part of the, the whole agency or if you have uh, vital records in different multiple locations as well. You can split them out or you can write them as one plan and have an appendix that talks about uh, building 3B's um, staffing and building 3B's alternate location and building 3B's vital records or that sort of thing. You can put all of that into your appendices in your coup plan. Your coup plan should be written so that if you needed to make it public, it could be made public because it doesn't have any of that critical information in it that would be threat that would threaten the plan. All of your critical information like phone numbers and, and titles, you should never put people's names in a coup plan. You should always do it by by uh, by title. Those titles, all of the who's going to do what, that critical information should be written into an appendices or into an annex of the plan. Yvette, hi Yvette. Um, what department do we contact for building inspectors to evaluate our facilities after a disaster? 
Is there a list of companies that will offer space in a disaster for office space? Those are really interesting questions, both of them. Let's talk about the building inspector first. If you have an earthquake situation and you don't know whether your building is, you're able to get back into your building, this, you'll have to have a building inspector do an inspection of that building. That most likely is going to take some time in order for that to happen. Now, you might have someone in your agency that has those capabilities. There are some trainings that can get you uh, individuals trained to be able to do building inspections. There's a difference between a building inspection and a safety inspection. A safety inspection doesn't have to have the, the um, official uh, licensed inspector to inspect it for safety, but, um, but the, the, the uh, whether a building is safe to, to enter or not is, is going to certainly be the first thing that you're going to need to do to, to determine whether or not you go back into that building. There are building inspectors in the cities and in the county. However, what I'm going to tell you is that if it's a if, if it's a catastrophic earthquake situation, those building inspectors are going to be inspecting city buildings and county buildings. So plan that you're not going to be able to get a building inspector. You know how long it takes to get a building inspector on a day to day basis, right? It's going to take an extra long time to get an actual city building inspector or county building inspector out to inspect your building. But it, you, I know you're in the city of San Jose, you would go through the city of San Jose's building inspectors. That would, that most likely is gonna be a long process. So my recommendation to you would be to look into getting some safety inspectors that you, that are part of your staff trained to be able to do a safety inspection on your building. As far as, um, a list of companies that will offer space, that's going to be uh, dependent on what the disaster is. You're not going to be able to write into your continuity of operations plan a relocation procedure if you don't already have uh, a relationship with a sister agency or a, the ability to uh, work with someone who has some office space that they might make available to you or um, <clears throat> something like that, as far as an alternate location is concerned, you're, um, we can help, Cadre can help in the disaster um, by putting it out. And if there are um, agencies that have space, they may come back and say, we've got some space, but that's not gonna be something you'll be able to write into your continuity of operations plan. So you'll want to, have some alternatives to that, a sister agency, one of your other buildings. I know you've got multiple buildings there. <clears throat> Maybe uh, you, I know you also at one point, Yvette, were working on a neighborhood um, planning process. So maybe working with some of your neighbors, some of your neighbor agencies as well, that might work out. Bernadette says uh, we're, they're using a San Francisco County template for their coop planning. I know a few years ago, UASI, which is the Urban Area <clears throat> Securities Initiative, initiative um, grant program, hired someone to write a template for local government. And that is, I believe, still on the UASI uh, website. We'll, have, we'll connect to some of those kind of documents for you. Um, online in in uh, in uh, on our website uh, cadresv.org, so you'll have access to some of those things. Um, Lars says uh, when making arrangements with parties for potentially having an alternate space available to you, it's a good idea to have an MOU. Yeah, make sure you've got it in writing, and make sure it's it's a little bit, you know, it's it's more than yes, I can use this building. It's how do I get keys to the building? Who's going to help me turn, know where to turn on the lights and all of those kind of things to, you know, make sure you take it to that level. Um, the uh, Bay Area um, UASI website is there on in the chat right now. So you can take a look at the 
the uh, template that's there. Now, recognize that that template was written for uh, local government, so it, there are there may be things in there that don't necessarily pertain to you, or that might be a little different from the agency that you have. So just bear that in mind. It was definitely it was written essentially for local government. Okay. And Cindy, this is Marcia. Um, I just wanted to add on for Yvette. So if you work with your team and identify the square footage that you would need and what kind of capabilities it needs to have, mm -hmm. and then we could we could maybe maybe help you find an organization or it might help you it might help help you realize that there's someone nearby, even a church or something, but it's not what's the, what do you have now? It's what, what's the bare minimum that you need in order to continue to perform that function. And then you made me think really all of a sudden about the building inspectors, because there is a prior, a prioritization that happens and the county will request mutual aid building inspectors come in from other places that have the certifications. And that is, is a long process, probably at least three days. And then the city will prioritize where they send them. I don't think that they will appreciate the, all of the nonprofits calling the city and saying, please come and inspect. I think it would probably be better to let Cadre know that. And then we can provide that list to them. Yes. or the VOAD if you're not in Santa Clara County and check with your VOAD and see if they can do that. But I think that would be a cleaner way to make sure that we can we can ensure that you stay on the list and we can track who's been inspected. But obviously you can't wait that long, you need to decide. And so if you're in doubt at all about the structural integrity, do not go in. And we can share, we have a, a safety inspection document that was created for or developed based on community emergency response team training, where it's you're looking at the horizontal and vertical lines of the building. So if the building seems to have shifted, you can't go in or look at the foundation if the foundation seems to have moved and it gives you some criteria so that you can make, a, you know, you can eyeball it and make a decision. But if, if you're not sure, you're going to have to say we can't be in this building. And can you perform your essential function outside or under a tent, which is just another thing to think about. Okay, that's it. Yeah, good points, Marcia. Thank you. Other questions, comments, thoughts? <clears throat> you can go ahead and unmute yourself if you'd like to speak up at this point. This is Bernadette. I, I, you know, this was very helpful. Um, and having to look at our coop and what my plan is for, you know, for our agency, is that how do you delineate the emergency and then the coop? Because I mean, I'm trying to figure out, you know, how to actually do do that. Because normally the coop happens because there's an emergency. So I'm just, you know, trying to figure out. The coop, could happen, the coop could happen, um, you could activate your coop if you were without power, if your building was without power, or if, it, you know, the, the fact that those two are separate doesn't necessarily mean that they don't get used together or that they do get used together. Just the difference is that the coop is focused on those essential functions. Yeah. And the, uh, the emergency operations plan is focused on the response to the disaster, whatever that looks like. You know, in the coop, we're not really responding to the disaster in any way. We're keeping up those essential functions. We're we're holding those essential functions up until, until someone else responds to the disaster and the disaster ends, or you know, we've got a we've got another longer term plan. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where do we go from here? Let's talk a little bit about, I'm gonna give you um, an, as an essential functions, uh, I'm gonna give you a workbook that's got a lot of information in it. The first tab talks specifically about essential functions. And what I'm gonna ask you to do is take that workbook back with you. I'm gonna send one to each of you. Um, I have your email addresses 
from registration. And um, I will send that to each of you and take that back to your agency, meet with whoever you need to meet with or, or do it on your own, whatever it takes to write down not just your essential functions for your department, but all the functions that your agency does. Write those, you know, that doesn't have to be detailed, um, but we're gonna walk through a little bit of a process on that first tab of the workbook to determine which of those functions are essential to help you to help make that process a little clearer for you. And maybe even to be able to break those functions into tiers, okay? Um, where do you go to find out, you know, to think about those kind of things? Well, your agency's mission statement might be a good place to look. If you have a disaster mission statement, that's a very clear way to, uh, to start looking at what your essential functions might be. Um, reviewing your organizational chart might spark some things for you um, and help you to understand what that list of essential functions are, or even what it is that your agency does to be able to write it down on that first tab in your workbook that will be going out to you. And then I would say um, what I have done in the past is I have asked departments to allow me to speak with the staff who actually do those essential functions because they may be they may have procedures or uh, a process that they can that they can do those functions from home or they I know how to do these functions I have already taught someone else how to do them they're you know schedule that meeting with the staff who are going to be involved in the process so that you don't have to think about what those essential functions are all on your own and if you're a small agency you know i know we've got a few small agencies where there's maybe only two or three people in in the whole agency um you know maybe that's one person that's going to be doing all of the essential functions for your agency you know so that one person can write the coop plan and you know, figure out what it is that needs to get done and how they're going to get it done under those different circumstances. Okay. Next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, so I did just talk about that we're we'll be sending you the uh, template for essential functions. Write down all of those functions. Just give a brief description. The write the function down and give a brief description of the function and who's responsible for that function. Not necessarily who's doing it, but who's responsible for it. Because if you've got a department that has 10 people working in it and there's a department head, the department head is most likely the one responsible for that function, even though they're not necessarily the one that does the function. However, you know whoever it is that's doing the function will ultimately be the one that's written into the plan by title. Um, you know, an analyze the criticality of the function in each agency. So take a look at those agents at, at each one of those functions and determine what's going to happen if this function isn't accomplished. What is the fallout? What's the, you know, what happens? Um, and then, you know, prioritizing those functions. So that first tab will have it has a couple of columns that give you the ability. It's got some questions that you can ask um, to, to prioritize those functions and to determine whether or not those are essential functions or not. And then determine, we'll be going on further to talk a little bit about what resources we're going to need for each of those functions. But for the time being, I would like for you to just take a look over the next week at what your functions are, all of your functions, and get a brief description of those functions and the responsible person performing those functions, okay? And if you already have a coup plan and you wanna take a look at those essential functions that you've got written into your coup plan and determine whether or not you have them all in your, in your coup plan, the disasters that have happened recently from COVID to the floods to uh, power outages and all of those kind of things, maybe uh, you need to change some of those. Maybe you need to add some different ones. Maybe you need to go, oh gosh, um, I found that we didn't need to do this essential function at all. We didn't think it, we thought it was going to be really important, but it's not. It's not as, 
it's not as necessary during a disaster as we thought it was going to be. So maybe some things will come off of your list as well. Um, I encourage people to keep their list as small as possible. If you question whether or not a function is an essential function, just keep in mind that when there's a disaster going on and you only have a few people to be able to do these things and you have to go to an alternate location and you need to use uh, continuity communications and you don't have access to your records, what are those things that you're going to want to be trying to accomplish or keep that you're going to need to be trying to keep going, you know, um, and, and is it, you know, is this one of them? Is emptying the trash one of them? Is um, payroll one of them? Is, you know, picking up the mail one of them? You know, are those things, things that we're going to need to continue to do? Do we really need to consider all of those essential functions? Okay. Um, I am available. My email address is cindy at cadresv.org. If you have questions throughout the week, certainly um, I will avail myself to answer whatever questions specific or otherwise that you might have about writing essential functions. If you feel that this is a uh, uh, not a long enough time frame to be able to write essential functions and you have to put a department of people together to do this, hopefully we will give you some of the tools so that you can do it going forward. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, I talked about our homework. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, writing those essential functions down, writing down all of the functions. In our next session, we're gonna take a look at writing a coop plan for your agency by taking a look at some of the other those little yellow triangles you know alternate facilities alternate staff all of those kind of things and then of course training staff is going to be critical to this process you know making sure that um, staff are trained and cross-trained but that the staff whose titles are written into those plans maybe you've got 10 um people that work in payroll, are they all critical to the plan? Do they all need to be trained in how to use the plan? You know, training that staff and then exercising that plan. So that's where we're going from here, okay? Any questions? All right, next slide. Okay, oh, I, whoops, I got the wrong, I've got the wrong, flyer up there. Our next class is next Monday, same time, same station, uh, same uh, Zoom number that you've, you, you registered for the first session. You are um, already in uh, registered for the sex, second session, so you don't need to re-register at this point. Um, but we will meet again at 10 o'clock on the 27th to continue continuity of operations planning. Um, will the full deck be shared after this meeting? Um, I don't know that we will have this presentation up on our website by the time, I don't, I'm not sure how that's gonna work. We usually wait, we usually takes us a few days to get it up on the website. But at some point, both of these slide decks will be the first session as well as the second session and any other backup materials that we have available to you, as well as um, access to those um, templates that we know about. Um, that will all be on our website, uh, cadresv.org, um, under Continuity of Operations Planning. So you can look in preparedness and go to continuity of operations planning and you'll see all of this material. I will be sending the spreadsheet, the workbook out to you uh, as soon as we finish this class and um, making that available to you. And, and as I said, if you have any questions, you know, you're certainly welcome to um, email me throughout the week if you, uh, if you run into any kind of issues, okay? All right. Well, with that, I grace you with uh, about uh, 37 minutes after you finish the completing the survey. You know, this is how we get paid. We have uh, grant funding to do these kind of workshops. 
And what they require from us is that we have you complete a survey at the end of the session. Now, because this is a two session process um, for this class, we'll, you can complete the survey today or you can wait and do it next week. We'd prefer that you um, at least do it one of the two times and so that we can gather as much information as possible. The survey will pop up as soon as you get out of this session. Uh, it will automatically pop up for you. And with that, I thank you all for being here today. And if you don't have any questions, um, we'll grace you with a few extra minutes of your day.